I'm a technology manager for um, what we call enterprise IT. I've been in the tech game longer than I want to discuss, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's been a good ride. I've been part of e-commerce companies for a long while. I've been at Wayfair. I've been at uh, ProSieben St. Irons. I'm currently at what, uh, Just Eat Takeaway. Um, but I have quite a bit of experience in the tech world, some in the data protection and privacy world, a bit of a project management guy, um, all sorts of weird experiences. But that's who I am. If you want to have any more questions about that, you come see me afterwards. I can talk for a very long time. Um, quick intro to the topic. Like, when the invitation came around to partake at, the, uh, at this community day, it was very interesting to me to think what would be interesting. You know, I, I know there's going to be a lot of different um, people sat in the room, and I've got a feeling there's going to be some really good technical insights about how to use EasyBI and what sort of functions and, and systems you can, you can use it with. That's not really the topic for me today. It's not going to be a technical talk. This is more about the journey that we had with the product, um, the challenges that we faced, the problems that we came across, and, and why we made the decisions we did. And we thought maybe sharing this journey with you might be of interest. So let's see. <laughs> OK, so you may or may not know who we are. I hope that you might have heard of Just Eat, but you may have not. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction about who we are as a business. So these are some of our brands around the world. Um, I work particularly at the Liferando brand, which is based here in Berlin. Um, you may have recognized that I'm not German. <laughs> I'm actually English, but I've lived here in Germany for 10 years. Um, unlike uh, our introductory uh, speaker, um, whose German is better than mine, I'm not going to use any German today, so <laughs> very sorry about that, uh, my German colleagues. <laughs> um, we are uh, a leading global online food delivery marketplace. Lovely, lovely marketing speech there. What does that mean? Um, we're moving from food to be more comprehensive, but I want to tell you a, little bit, a few facts about us. We have uh, 20 countries in total, so we have quite a global reach. Uh, we have 700,000 connected partners that we work with. So um, they utilize our platform to, to deliver the services that we provide. Um, we have a very diverse customer base with 8.4 million active uh, users of our applications, uh, many uh, smartphone applications. And we have a fantastic team of at least 13,000 people globally. So um, as you can see, even just from those numbers, there's going to be a lot of data here, I'm afraid. <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> um, what does that mean? Um, we are a platform, primarily, like most e-commerce companies. We have uh, one side where we have our partners who utilize our systems to be able to take orders. Um, orders can be fast food, it can be groceries, it can be even uh, stores such as Media Mark that we're sort of dipping into now. Um, their customers will come through our app, make their selections, those selections go to our partners, and then those partners then deliver. We also have a selection of delivery uh, side of the company, utilizing our own vehicles and riders to then deliver the goods if the partners want them. So it's quite a complex model. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces. And the 13,000 people I mentioned don't even include all of the riders that we have, which is a significant amount of people. Okay? Um, that's a little bit about just eat takeaway. Here we are. Here are the countries that we are currently uh, uh, occupying. Um, we see Germany as our home nation. Um, these numbers I, I've already read out mostly, but I want to kind of call out the 891 million orders we had in 2023. Now, <laughs> um, as you can imagine, not every order is as successful as we'd like it to be. Um, not every order is um, probably even fulfilled. But insight into those orders is fundamental to what we do. We have a lot of internal systems. We have a lot of different teams that are based on this analytics. I'm not a part of those teams, but I know they utilize a lot of our services. Where do I sit within this? Um, my team, we call the Enterprise IT team, and we are basically supporting this business. It's important for us to ensure that this business are able to function and deliver what they need to function. Right. So we provide laptops, we provide services, applications, all of this through a ticket-based system. Jira, of course. Right. So. <laughs> About a year and a half ago, we, we had a lot of different multiple platforms being utilized. We had a lot of different um, teams working with different portals. We consolidated this down into one portal. Um, and this portal, we wanted to make it uh, as robust as possible, but also gain information about it. Right? We wanted to know why people were doing certain things, why they were making the requests they were making. We wanted to understand our, our, our services in terms of performance and, and speed. 
Um, we looked into Jira service management because we were using Jira service management tool set. Um, I'm afraid it didn't, we found it somewhat limited. Like the, the, the information that you could pull from this and the reports that you could generate, it wasn't really what we were looking for. So we looked around um, and EasyBI was being utilized in our product and tech side of the business. So our software developers were using it quite extensively to report on their own projects. We thought, wow, this is actually something that we could utilize simultaneously. Um, so we stepped into that and we thought, well, how do we get started, right? So we started building up our basic representation. I'm sure you've all had the same experiences. You start with your first created versus resolve graph and you go into EasyBI and you open it up and you think, oh my God, how does this thing work? <laughs> Completely different from anything I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so you, then you go through the, I'm super happy about the uh, AI assistant, by the way, I think that's gonna make a big difference. Um, but we, we went through our learning curve. We started to understand about how it worked and um, we started to split out our standard fields and locations and teams to try and get a bit of insight into what was happening. Very interesting, you say. Um, we used to have some auto calculations, such as trend lines, and we were able to say, okay, we see our services holistically now for, for the first time. That was kind of nice. We then moved on to combining reports for overviews, right? So we built some dashboards, we put in similar reports together, we started tailoring those insight requirements such as weekly and daily, and maybe even sort of project-based between uh, things like uh, age tickets over a certain time frame, maybe we're interested about geodiversity on the, on the ticket front, and we're sort of able to build up usable dashboards. We moved across a little bit more into complex configurable reports using custom fields the drop down the filters and the page selections. That was a nice experience because then the people we were generating the, the dashboards for could then interact with them. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. And if you're not, it's, it's, it was a very useful feature that was able to remove the complexity of Easy BI and allow people who would be very scared of it to touch it. So that was quite a nice step. I'm sure this is all very familiar to you, but uh, <laughs> this was our journey. A very uh, exa uh, interesting example of a first report just split out by different uh, countries. As you can see, we have a very large amount of incoming requests uh, on, a, on a monthly basis. You know, we're talking around 10,000 tickets a month on average. So that's a lot of data to kind of process and to understand why, you're, why is your service working the way it is? What's the blockers? What's the optimal uh, situation that you should be actually looking for? Um, in itself, though, this report doesn't tell you much except, you know, Christmas isn't very busy, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's about it. But, you know, it was a nice start. And then we moved into this, which is quite a monstrosity. <laughs> and I'm not super proud of it, but I bet you've all been in this situation where you're like, oh, I've got these great graphs. I'm going to put them all in one place and I'm going to talk about how amazing they are. And, and then you show this to your management. They're like, oh, my God, what have you done? <laughs> and you're like, uh, yeah, but this is really interesting because I can see all these different... In They're like, that's too much. Take it away, please. So... You know, I, it's been a really good experience, but we thought, okay, that's, that can't be the way it is. Right? We must be able to do this better. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit now about the challenges and the opportunities. Um, first off, one of our major challenges. Reporting was traditionally seen within the business as bureaucracy, something that other people do or make you do, and it isn't your job. <laughs> um, something that is going to be tedious, it's going to be repetitive. It's going to be something that doesn't add any value to what I do. That was a really hard mentality to get over. Um, and I understand it. When you're presented with something like the previous graph, you can be <laughs> taken in by that quite easily, right? Um, knowledge and learning gaps. When we talk about performance of service, um, you have to understand what your service is. And a lot of our team didn't. A lot of our team knew that what their job was and they knew what the kind of top end outcome was. They missed the complete middle bit, the service level. We didn't have any training guides. We didn't have any um, sort of tool set to say, this is how you understand what we do. Unfortunately, that's where we were. Um, context is king. I just showed you the last, gra last graphs, right? And you found that this was pretty daunting in many ways. And I, I would agree with you, mainly because this means nothing to you. It's just some, some wavely lines, right? Unless you know the, our business, unless you know what my team does on a weekly basis or a daily basis, it's irrelevant. And even when you do have some knowledge, are you going to remember every single time you look at it? Are you going to remember every single time that person opens the graph? Or when you transfer that to another uh, external stakeholder, are they going to 
understand this. That was a big challenge for us. How do we go about addressing this situation? So going back to our challenges, whoopies. I repetitively came across this phrase, and I wanted to kind of highlight it. I am not a data person. <laughs> what? I, uh, analysis of performance is not my role. That's your, somebody else's role. That's somebody else. That's the, isn't, don't we have data scientists in this company? Wait, what? <laughs> um, this is a tool to help you understand what you do, isn't it? So that was a challenge. Like, how do we get over that somebody else's responsibility mentality? Um, here are some tips. <laughs> Whether they are perfect, probably not. Whether they're going to be good for you, I don't know. But they, they worked for us, right? And so, you know, the first thing we did, I would say, was take them on the journey. The worst thing you can possibly do Go back to your desk, go back to your office, spend a, a month creating reports and coming back to your leadership and saying, look what I made. Because you're going to get, in my experience, just baffled faces. Like, why are we here? What are you talking about? So we created a situation where we went through, a, we, we said, look, we don't know how to use this system. Let's make sure everybody understands it. Base one. We did trainings, we did internal documentation, and we talked about why we're going on this journey. Right? Then we said, but what reports do we need? What, what really helps us to do our job? And that's why every cycle of report change was back to the leadership, back to the leads, back to the, the, the engineers, so they, so they would have input into what we were doing. If they don't, I mean, the insight becomes irrelevant. Um, next up, the, benefit, the benefits of standards. Um, the ability to move between reports and understand what each report means based on your lack of knowledge like, is difficult. So we said, all right, let's stop. Let's, let's delete all the reports we had before because they were just tests. Let's say this is how we report on this piece of information. This is what this means. Let's write it down. Let's understand every single aspect so that when you look at a different report, they've created that report the same way, and they've created the report the same way. And so you have ability to move between reporting, move between dashboards, and you still understand. That's the journey, right? Um, the next part, what I was talking about, is the uh, obtaining the buying the sticks. Now, uh, I don't know if you've experienced this phenomenon. We had this situation where there was there was challenges to get over. We did the training, we did the uh, kind of journey pit, and then everyone was like, "Yay, I'm back to my normal job now." <laughs> Great, All right? So um, that was a bit sad. So we had to say, well, "How do we keep them involved in what we're doing?" What was important was bake the reporting and observation of the reporting into their daily and weekly tasks. What does that mean? It's OK to um, not understand how the reports are created, but utilizing the reports to make decisions became very important. Right? It became part of what we did. Me, my leads, my teams, we meet on a weekly basis. We bring the reports up. We look at them. We talk about them all the time as part of what we do. So we can continually utilize the information that's there. That's, and that became vital because then you're not suddenly having to learn a new report or suddenly having to learn a different viewpoint. This is part and parcel of what you do all the time. And when a chart or report comes up, you have a familiarity with it that allows you to spot inconsistencies, particularly in services level. There's a, there's a, there's a, a small blip in the chart, there's a weird number, and you're like, ah, OK, that's why it's weird, because of that level of familiarity, because you've baked it into your daily work. If you leave it alone and you come back three months later, you probably have no idea what that report was about. So <laughs> something that we learnt the hard way. Um, enjoy the rewards. I think, I don't know about other industries, but I know particularly in, in the tech world, we're pretty rubbish about celebrating success in general. Like, we think about the next challenge, the next challenge, the next challenge, the next challenge, which is great, but sometimes it's important to stop and say, okay, but why did we fix that? Why did it get better? And connecting the insight that you found to the change that you made and then publishing that within the within your team, within the department, within the company, celebrating that success builds momentum. It brings people on the journey. It takes them into the same situation you are. And you can start to have a much better um, understanding and happiness about what you're doing. Right? And, the, and, and the delivery sticks. You know, People are then like, oh, that reporting was worthwhile. That 
effort we put in into acknowledging it was worthwhile. So, yeah, that was something that we found very useful. Um, so everything went smoothly? No. <laughs> Obviously. What happened? Um, we had too much unstructured reporting data, um, which in the end turned out to be worse than having none at all. People were making graphs and reports that were overwhelming, overwhelming, and not through any fault of their own, right? It's not because they had, um, uh, you know, uh, bad moods or a bad day or they just had other challenges. It's just because everyone was trying to proactively be the best they could be, and that's all we want from anybody, right? So we thought, what could we do to help this? And, you know, we talked about the information overload. You know, people were sort of getting reports on a more regular basis, so they were running their own ports, their reports from the company, the department. They get to a report fatigue creeps in. There's like, if I see another report, I'm going to just shut my computer and go home today. <laughs> right? And that, that takes down lots of context. And if you lose context, you've lost trust. If you lose trust, people drop the reports, they go on. So we're like, okay, so what do we do? We've still got some really good information. We want to carry on keeping those insights involved. So we said, right, there are two things we have to do. We have to simplify it. Let's make this, at a glance, understandable. People should get a report, and because of the things that we've done, they should understand it. There should be inline guides, so I don't have to go and find the information to explain the report I've done. Right? So if you've got a dashboard, there should be a nice way to be able to say, what does that mean, immediately, without having to go and dig somewhere. Um, it's important to solicit feedback and monitor uh, the usage of the reports. Uh, some of the lovely uh, usage statistics are very exciting. We're going to try and leverage that a bit more. But also, at the people level, go to the leads, go to your managers, go to your product owners, sit with them and say, did you look at the report this week? How was it? Do you hate it? Should I stop doing it? <laughs> right? Continually have those conversations. Because if you don't, you're going to find that you're just going to hammer reports at people for no reason at all. And that's, that's not great. <laughs> um, and then remove unnecessary clutter. There is a tendency, and I've fallen this to myself quite a few times, to be super proud of that report you just created, right? You're like, God damn it, that's great. <laughs> but, um, and then you could get a bit, maybe abrasive about changing it. You're like, actually, I put a lot of effort into this. I've really <laughs> spent a long time on this. Why is it not what you wanted? You've got to let that go. Even though it, I, I completely understand it because of the effort and energy you've put in, embrace the change. Realize that all reporting is an evolving landscape, and every week, that report could improve. It might not, but it could. <laughs> um, next up was standardized information. We said, OK, no more individual reports um, if, uh, that are going to be shared. If you want to make reports for yourself, go nuts. If you're going to share them in the business, they need to be standardized. They need to be understandable. We need to, we need to get the uh, uptake of information higher. We need to lower the learning curve for our stakeholders. Um, we want to remove the fear of complexity. We'll go back to that monstrosity of a dashboard earlier where people just freak out because it's too much information. Um, and, we want, and this is the big sell to my team, minimize the reporting impact to our time. It shouldn't be something that we spend hours on. It shouldn't be something that we have to maintain more than our job. It needs to work with us. That's, that was really important. So a lot of these things we were able to achieve. We, moved, we utilized small plug for easy BI for compliments. <laughs> Very good. We were able to utilize that additional tool set to create templates within compliments to bring in reports and add simultaneous context. So that these reports were then being sent. They had the information graphs. They had comments and observations. They have links to, sh to take you to what the graph actually means, all built into one place. And then that place is standard. There's no other places for reports. You don't have to go looking for them. You don't have to dig through folders or find the dashboard. This is where it is. Go find it. Um, we're still on this journey, and it's, um, it's going very well. People that, um, I would say, I don't want to say obtuse. That's probably too strong. But definitely not, not super happy about having to create reports are actively participating in this now. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a nice success for us. It's really good. I mean, the information here is quite varied, and 
uh, probably not very specific to you guys, but my guys, <laughs> they get very excited when they see this report. My chaps? Nice. <laughs> What's next? Um, we are looking to get support from our side teams in adoption. Right? We are one group of teams in one pillar in the organization. It would be great if our other pillar, people in the pillar did it the same way we did, get that standardization across the board. Um, so we're going to try and package our journey to allow them to take the same one, or if not, quite similar. Um, we're also going to repackage this as a service to our customers. I mentioned that we were internal IT, enterprise IT systems, right? This is something that our customers, finance, HR, like marketing, sales, they could do it the same way if we gave them the tool set, if we gave them the, the mechanisms to do it, if we gave them the guides. So that's what we're trying to package now. Um, we're hoping it's going to streamline globally the business. And lastly, finding the pain points in our service. This is something why we started this journey. Um, we want to be able to still see why <laughs> Why does this person's laptop in Australia take four weeks to build? Why is that person unhappy? Why has my ticket for my incident been um, sitting around for a week? Because we don't want that. They don't want that. And if we don't spend time doing this, then we'll miss out. So we're still on that journey. And I don't think that's ever going to stop. I want to say thanks very much. Uh, any questions? So then, uh, oh, sorry. Oh. Damn it, I thought I got away. While we are setting up the next speaker, so. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. Hi. Um, uh, I was wondering if, with so many reports and templates that you are creating, do you allow anyone to create reports, or do you have like a standard team that are the ECBI report creators? Because we struggle a lot with giving people freedom because of timeouts and created a crazy reports, but at the same time, yeah. uh, we struggle with bottlenecks of creating all the reports that everyone wants. Completely agree. Um, and to be a pain, both. <laughs> <laughs> because both of those things are true, right? They have to be able to create their own reports. That's the value, that's what we're trying to push. But we do want them to do it in our way. That's, that's, that's a need. <laughs> so we created the standardization, the framework to say, you must do it this way. And so we have a group of people who are more invested in that, who then help people that aren't, right? So we say, oh, by the way, here's some documentation. Please take your report, go back, do it this way. You know? and, and that sort of framework approach uh, is better for us, to be honest. Um, we wouldn't be able to be the bottleneck because we don't have the specialists in-house. Uh, so um, I don't know you have externals. Can I ask how many people you have creating reports? Could you say more or less? Or are these just people Ooh. that work in something else and have the capability of creating these reports? So in our department, um, probably around 30 to 40 uh, creating, like, who are directly responsible for reports, but anyone in the, in the, in the 300 plus team could if they wanted to. Okay, <coughs> thank you. No problem.